Here we are on the drive to Rustenburg. I'm, I'm sitting with Grant Wall, um, and we're in the back seat of the car. And uh, I got the opportunity to ask him a few questions. So first off, obviously, I'm curious as to Grant. How long have you been at SI? Uh, I've been there since uh, late 1996. Uh, so I guess uh, 13 and a half years. Wow. Now. Uh, have you been covering soccer the whole time you've been there? Just about. Um, I. Uh, I guess I covered the 96 Olympics as a summer intern at the Miami Herald. Oh, cool. Uh, got to the magazine, and, and to be honest, not many writers wanted to cover soccer uh, at the time. And so whenever we did it, which wasn't that often, um, I was able to do some stuff and um, started doing college basketball as well. And uh, those ended up becoming the two sports I covered. Cool. Um, you know, has, how has the landscape changed over the past 13 years in regards to pro soccer in our country? Um, well, it, it doesn't change so much year to year, but if I compare it now to what it was then, uh, we do a lot more soccer uh, in the magazine and online and all those things. Um, so uh, it's exciting. I went full-time soccer in January, which is uh, something that I've always wanted to do, but there was never enough demand uh, from SI to do it. Interesting. And uh, so, and that's not just during a World Cup year, that's for the years afterward, too. They're going to give me a nice opportunity to uh, build maybe a bigger audience for the sport, which um, I, I'm excited about. I've always thought that if we covered the sport the right way every year, SI could really take advantage of the fact that a lot of top soccer stars internationally are willing to give us more access than they give to European journalists because they want to get bigger in America. They feel like it's the last untapped market uh, for them, and so they're willing to do things they wouldn't normally do. Um, you know, as a as a fan, as a soccer fan, how did you you know get into soccer? Were you were you uh, always living in America? Um, did you play soccer growing up? Um, you know, how did you kind of get into the game? Um, like most American kids, I quit playing when I was 12 years old uh, and went on to other sports. But I got back into watching it probably for the 1990 World Cup. Okay. Uh, I was uh, 16 years old. The U.S. was playing in the World Cup for the first time in 40 years, and I watched a lot of those games. Uh, and then the U.S. obviously hosted the 94 World Cup, so there was a big lead up to that. Uh, I got involved in... Um, uh, I went to South America, actually, uh, a couple of times in college uh, to do some reporting uh, and also did my senior thesis on uh, politics and soccer in Argentina. So I lived down there for three years, uh, hung out a lot with the fans of Boca Juniors, actually, and uh, really kind of developed a love for the sport and the culture around it and the fact that it was so global that you could really learn a lot about the world uh, through soccer. Hey Amen. That's uh, you know I was a sociology major in school and, and I, I concentrated on sports and society and soccer has always been obviously the one thing around the world that always goes beyond the, just a game. You know it, it does so much more for people around the world. I you know that's inspiring to, to hear. Um, you know moving on to uh, you know this World Cup. Uh, what are your expectations for for, for our team here? The uh, U.S. Yeah. Um... You know, I think the kind of baseline expectation would be to get to the second round. Um, and if the U.S. doesn't do that, it would be a huge disappointment, maybe even a failure, I think. Um, you know, the, the group is not the hardest of groups. The U.S. is uh, the second best team if you come into it just looking at the teams on paper. Um, and so there's pressure on them. And, and that's a good thing, I think. I think it means people care. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, if you go beyond the second round, I think that would be uh, exceeding expectations. What, um, what do you think that we need to, to, to be successful at in order to, to uh, you know, get out of the group stage? What are the, what are the key, you know, what would you say uh, the, the team would need to be strong? What aspects on the field would the team need to be strong at in order to succeed? Um, I, I think just you got to score goals, you know? I mean, like, that's something that seems so basic, but... You look back at the 2006 World Cup, and, and the U.S. only scored one goal on its own. It got an own goal against Italy. Right. Uh, I think had less than or fewer than ten shots on on target during the entire tournament, which is just pathetic. Yeah. Uh, so you got to put yourself in a position to score goals uh, if you want to advance in this tournament. Um, you know, obviously everyone knows about the Landon Donovans and the Clint Dempseys and the Tim Howards on our team, but uh, you know, with your with your inside knowledge on on U.S. national soccer. 
uh, you know, who might be a player that might stick out at this at this World Cup that uh, you know people might not know about. Uh, I'd keep an eye on uh, on Hercules Gomez. Uh, he's probably going to be a super sub uh, coming off the bench during this tournament, but he's shown in Mexico this year that he can score a lot of goals even coming off the bench. Right, because most of his goals in Mexico were as a as a substitute, were they not? Right, right. Um, well, you know, as uh, as you know, now we have an idea of the U.S.'s chances and hopes. Uh, who do you think is going to be the front runner to to to, to, to win this whole thing? Well, there's two co-favorites, Spain and Brazil. Yeah. Um, you know, Spain's gone almost four years uh, with only one loss, that being to the U.S. Uh, last year in South Africa. And Brazil is you know, the, the number one ranked team in the world right now. Uh, they may not play the beautiful game as much as they used to under Dunga, but uh, it's a really effective style that they've got and just you know, remarkable players uh, on both sides of the ball on that yep. team. Uh, who do you think is a team that is uh, might be a sleeper? You know here, uh, you know that might exceed expectations. Well, you know, for what it's worth, my own uh, predictions have not always been the greatest. <laughs> but uh, saying that, uh, I have Serbia uh, making a, a run. If you if you look at my picks in our magazine, uh, we got Serbia making it to the semifinals. Uh, there's always one surprise semifinalist. It seems like, and uh, they seem to fit that description. They they. Were really good in qualifying. Uh, we're better than France in their qualifying group. Uh, they got a lot of very solid players along the back line and some good veterans in the attack. Um, seems like a team that uh, could come out of that group with Germany, uh, Ghana, and Australia uh, and, and do some damage. Um, you know, last, lastly, you know, there's there's always a couple teams that disappoint at these events. Uh, you know. France in 2002, and um, you know this year it looks like France and Italy both might have some trouble. Um, you know who do you think? Uh, you know obviously the prediction game is a difficult game to play, but you know who hasn't impressed you at all? You know that has a big name. Well, for what it's worth, you know I, I, I think France. You know we've already seen one game uh, in which they didn't impress, uh, and you know I think it's a real possibility that they won't get out of Group A. But uh, and you look at Italy. I, I think if Italy wasn't in the easiest group of the tournament, they might be a concern as well. But I think they will get out of that group. Yeah, I think uh, so too. But for a world champion, uh, Italy is an awfully old team, uh, and I, I'm a little surprised by some of the picks that Libby made. Uh, he left home for basically their four best strikers in Italy. You could argue who are healthy are not here: Del Piero, Balotelli, Cassano. And Dante, and that's sort of mystifying to me. I was really upset he didn't take Mikuli. I, I just I thought he had a great year at Palermo, and I think he deserved to be here above a number of players that he decided to take up front. But um, you know, lastly, I guess I'm gonna ask one more thing. You know, players around the world, young guys that are coming onto the stage, you know, probably might have a breakout a breakout tournament that could lead to a nice European contract. Uh, Giovanni dos Santos last night played really well, I thought, and he. He definitely is making a case to, you know, have a, a predominant role in Tottenham in the future as his his home team. Are there any players that might be flying under the radar right now that uh, you are uh, interested to see? Well, I don't know how much they'll fly under the radar, but a guy like Algero Elia for uh, the Netherlands is, you know, he plays in Hamburg, a really promising winger, uh, almost kind of like the latter day Mark Overmarsh, but faster. Right. Uh, and. I think he's going to get a good opportunity in this tournament uh, to move to an even bigger club. Um, I look at a guy like Nicholas Nkulu for uh, Cameroon, uh, who's really young, he's only 21, central defender, he's at Monaco right now, but I, I think he's in a position to have a really good tournament and make a move to a huge club. Um, so Dos Santos, just like you said, uh, had a good first game, uh, has struggled a little bit in establishing, establishing himself in Europe. Uh, this is the kind of thing that might uh, attract, you know, greater interest. Well, everybody, uh, you know, thanks, for Grant Wall, for coming out with us today, and make sure to follow him as the head head staff writer, uh, soccer writer at Sports Illustrated. Yeah. And uh, you know, check out his his blog on the World Cup and uh, go USA. Good luck today. Thanks a lot. Thanks.